So uh, now we're going to be uh, treated to a uh, bit of daring do as Rex Buchanan will give his lecture with only one arm. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, I've had the pleasure of seeing Rex uh, speak on several occasions, so you're all in for a treat. Uh, Rex has the, the impressive title of Director Emeritus of the Candace Geological Survey, where he worked for a number of years. Uh, you were the, actually the director for about, what, about five or six years? Six, six, six and a half years. He remembers every day, I suspect. Um, he has a number of uh, publications, some of which you, uh, you may be aware of, um, namely like the Traveler's Guide to the Geology and Landmarks of Kansas, published by University Press of Kansas. Also, Kansas Geology, an introduction to landscapes. And he's also done some work recently on uh, carbon sequestration and also was involved in uh, leading a task force to talk about the implications of wastewater injection wells in Kansas, if memory serves. But what I really appreciate about, about Rex, beyond his numerous publications, of which I'm not going to list them all because they are, in fact, more numerous than I can list, is Rex has always been very good about public engagement and bringing that connection together between the research world and uh, the world of public policy and public dialogue. And so what Rex will be talking to us about today is reflections, I think, uh, based upon his decades plus work in this area regarding water. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all Rex Buchanan. Thank you, Jay. Is this, is this mic working okay? We're good? All right, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the chance to be here today. Uh, Jay mentioned this book that I did, Roadside Kansas, uh, is, is the title. And it, it connects with this talk because when that book first came out, I had uh, lunch with a friend of mine from the English department, Kansas Geological Survey as a division of, of KU. And I had lunch with a friend of mine from the English department who said he had just gotten this book, he'd read it, he was really impressed, he liked it a lot, he was really impressed with the way we had made, my co-author and I had made water the subtext of the book. Now, I don't know where I was the day that we covered the topic of subtext in English classes, but uh, I didn't know what a subtext was. I, I'm still not really sure, but like most people, I don't like to really appear ignorant, and so I said something like, thank you for noticing that. And it brought home to me that you cannot really talk about Kansas, and really the Midwest and the Great Plains, without talking about this issue of water. So that's what we're going to do this morning, talk about primarily about Kansas. Uh, I think it's a good place because it typifies some of the issues that Cynthia raised already and uh, because water is so central to so much of what we do. So I'm going to focus on some background and two or three of what I consider really critical issues and uh, we'll cover those today. Now, one of the points, again, I, I really want to leave you with is how central this topic is to this state. And I'll tell you a story. A few years ago, I was working on a research project with one of our folks on springs in Kansas. And we were out in Kiowa County down in south central Kansas. It was a Friday. It was hot. We were looking for springs in a drainage. And uh, we got done that Friday night, went back to the motel. And overnight, a cold front came through, like it often does in the fall in Kansas. We got up the next morning, it was 35 degrees, it was kind of a misty day, cold wind blowing from the north. We went up to the drainage where we were doing some water quality testing on springs. We walked down into the drainage and all of the trees, predominantly cedar trees, were covered with monarch butterflies. The monarchs were in their fall migration, they were headed south, they were hung up because of the cold front, they were waiting for the air to warm back up so they could take off again. But in this drainage, every tree, every cedar tree was covered with butterflies, dripping with butterflies. It was like these pictures you see of the monarch uh, where, they go to, where they migrate down in Mexico, where they spend the winter. I had never seen anything like it. And those butterflies were there because of the vegetation. And the vegetation was there because of the water. And it's an example of some of the things Cynthia was talking about, the connection between the natural history, the plants and the animals and the people and it all relates back to water. So let's talk about that in Kansas a little bit. You could talk about that in terms of plants and animals, and you could talk about it from the earliest days of when you have people here on the Great Plains 
This is a location real close to where I grew up in central Kansas. This is a native petroglyph, a rock carving. Uh, American Indians, Native Americans made these carvings in central Kansas dating back several hundred years. I've looked at a number of them over the years and in almost every case, not every one, but almost every case, they are associated with water. This particular rock carving is right up above a spring. It's right kind of down below about where I would be standing if you were to, to see these things. And very often where you see these petroglyphs in central Kansas, they're associated with water because that's where people went. Here's another one. These are bird figures very, very with, uh, with a spring just nearby. Water is, is a central part of people physically and spiritually and has been here on the Great Plains for a long, long time. That's true then when you begin to see Europeans come across the Great Plains. This is a, a spring location not too far uh, from, uh, it's in, in Marshall County, Kansas, not too far from the town of Blue Rapids. Now the actual spring itself is down here at the base of this uh, set of trees, these cedar trees. There just happens to be a waterfall up above it. This is a place called Alcove Springs. It was a stop on the uh, old Oregon Trail. It was actually named by the Donner Party, pretty well known in history for having some issues as they headed west. Uh, this is very close to the Big Blue River. And the Big Blue was in flood when the Donner Party came by. So they wound up here three or four days camped, waiting for the river to go down so they could go across it. They were already a little late getting started. They, begot, they were even more late by the time they got done. One of the members of the party that, uh, of, of the Donner Party actually died and was buried near here. I always kind of felt like she was maybe one of the lucky ones. Uh, so this is a spring that they named as they were headed west. And these spring locations, you see them on the trails that go across Kansas, the Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail. Very often those trails go from spring to spring to spring that fall on water courses. In the late 1800s, you begin to see these springs take on importance as uh, places that people go for uh, medicinal purposes. In both the United States and Europe in the 1800s, people went to spring water resorts to take the cure. They would drink the waters and bathe in the waters and, and use them in all sorts of ways. And we had a number of these kind of spring resorts in Kansas. This is the best known one. This is Wakanda Spring out uh, not too far from the town of Beloit in north central Kansas. That big white mound you see all those people standing on is a travertine. It's a mineral that's deposited by flowing water as the spring comes out of that circular feature with the fence around it there at the top. This uh, had a railroad track to it. It had a hotel that was built there. And as late as uh, 1950s, people were going to this place to take the waters, as they were in a number of resorts. Bonner Springs had one. There were a number of them here in eastern Kansas. This one today is under the, the waters of Wakanda Lake, which is a big lake out in that part of Kansas that was constructed in the mid-1960s. Now, I would kind of like to think that if we were facing the same issue of constructing that dam today, we might take the importance of this particular location a little bit more into account. But a lot of these reservoirs were constructed in Kansas in uh, the 1950s in light of the 1951 flood that was a big one here in, uh, throughout Kansas. And people didn't worry too much about the impact on historical locations. I have a friend from the geography department at KU who says that uh, he can take his boat out on Wakanda Lake and use the fish finder and still see this travertine mound from uh, this uh, from the spring that was uh, still under today about 30 or 40 feet of water. This is what is, I think, in effect, it's safe to say that really the only national park in Kansas. It's called Grass Prairie National Preserve. It's a, uh, a location down in the Flint Hills, north of Strong City, west of Emporia, about 11,000 acre facility where if you wanna go see the tall grass prairie in Kansas, this is probably the best, your best bet this uh, ranch today is, uh, it's called the Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve, but at uh, one time it was called the Spring Hill Ranch because of all the springs on this ranch. In fact, back behind the ranch house, which is shown here in the photograph, there was a spring that came out and was pumped down, or that flowed naturally down to the, in front of the house, and uh, water came up in a fountain from that spring, and there were springs all over the ranch 
uh, that come out of the, the limestones in, in, the, uh, in the Flint Hills. So in a variety of ways, you can see those connections with settlement. That house is where it is because of the springs. Those trails were where they were because of the springs and the rivers. All those connections go back to water. The cities in this state very often are where they are because of water. This is the confluence of the Ka on the uh, kind of the bottom there, the Kansas River and the Missouri River, not too far from where we are here today. That's why Kansas City is where it is. It's probably why we're standing here in the room because this is the junction of those two big rivers. That's uh, the Lewis and uh, the Ka Point that's sticking out there at the confluence of those two rivers. And uh, out on that little spit of land is where uh, Lewis and Clark purportedly camped one night as they were headed north up the Missouri River in 1804. This, is, uh, this picture is taken sort of from the proximity of the Lewis and Clark Viaduct, the big overpass there. I've never been sure how those guys got any sleep with all the, how Lewis and Clark got any sleep with all the traffic that they must have seen from the, from the Viaduct. Yeah, thank you for the rim shot there, Jay. Uh, same thing is true in, of Wichita. This is uh, the, the confluence of the Little, little Arkansas and the Arkansas rivers and the city of Wichita is founded on that confluence. Almost all, maybe not everyone, but almost all of the major cities in this part of the world are either at the confluence of rivers like this one or along rivers like where I live in Lawrence or Topeka or Manhattan or Junction City or Salina. Virtually all of the cities in Kansas are where they are because of water courses. All right, now we're going to get Mildly technical, don't freak out on me here. But this is important stuff if you really want to understand the nature of the water issues, not just in Kansas, but on the Great Plains. And this map I could spend a lot of time on, but I'll focus really on two things. One of the, the yellow dotted lines, those are lines of average annual precipitation. You can see it varies from, say, out in western Kansas where they get as little as 15 inches of rain per year to uh, down in southeastern Kansas where it may be as much as 44 inches of precip. Very dramatic difference from one end of that state to the other. Now, I want to make the point that this is average annual precip. And that number is a meaningful number, but one you have to be a little bit careful of. I grew up in the very center of Kansas, in Rice County, right, right, uh, right about there. Our average annual precip was 24 to 26 inches per year. And once I took a class with Don Worcester, who Jay was talking about, and I did a story, I did a, a paper on drought in the 1950s, because everybody's aware of drought in the 30s, but the 50s saw a time of dryness in Kansas too. I looked at annual precipitation in Kansas, and specifically in central Kansas during the 50s. And one thing that was clear to me was in Kansas, we very seldom get the average annual precip. We tend to get a lot more, we tend to get a lot less, but you very seldom see years where we get these averages. All right? So these are average numbers and don't really mean a lot in any given year. So not much water out west, a lot in the east. As a result, there's not much surface water, lakes, rivers, and streams, and I'll talk about them in a second, in western Kansas, but there's a lot in eastern Kansas. Now, the more important thing I want you to get from this map is availability of groundwater. And I'm going to talk about groundwater a lot. Groundwater is water that's found in the pore spaces of rocks in the subsurface. And I'll come back to that definition in a minute. In Kansas, this map shows how much water you can, groundwater you can expect to pump from a well just in general terms. You can't use this map to decide where you're going to sink a well in your backyard. It's not meant for that. But what you can see is that out in western Kansas, you can drill a well and you can pump 500, 1,000 gallons of water per minute out of those wells because of the Ogallala that Cynthia mentioned, and we'll, we'll get to the Ogallala in a minute. Uh, that's a lot of water. A garden hose might do a gallon or two. So to be able to pump 1,000, 1,500 gallons of water per minute from one well is really incredible. And you can see, all of the blue areas where you can do somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 gallons a minute. So all over western Kansas, you could produce a lot of groundwater. Eastern Kansas, almost exactly the opposite. Very little groundwater, but a lot of surface water. Cynthia made this point, and, I, and this is one that I think you really need to take away. 
in a lot of respects, Kansas is more like two states rather than one when it comes to water. It's like two states welded into one. Western Kansas has a lot of groundwater, but virtually no surface water. Eastern Kansas, exact opposite. Lots of surface water, but very little groundwater. So when people in Kansas begin to deal with this water issue that Cynthia talked about, and they begin to try to figure out how to deal with that economically and legally and in every other way, ethically, you keep in mind that you're really dealing with two very situ different situations. I'll come back to that again here in a minute. So, groundwater versus surface water. The guy who did this map calls it his Pac-Man map. <laughs> Blue is uh, the percentage that people are, are, are dependent on groundwater. Red is how the percentage that are dependent on surface water, county by county in Kansas. And what you see reflects that previous map. Western Kansas, very dependent on groundwater, as you would expect, with a few exceptions. Eastern Kansas, almost entirely dependent on surface water. So let's talk about groundwater a little bit. Like I said, groundwater is found in the pore spaces in rocks in the subsurface. People all the time are talking to me about, uh, talk to me about underground rivers and underground lakes. Those do occur in some places, but they don't really have anything to do with this conversation in Kansas. This water in the, um, in the subsurface is found in water-saturated rock formations. You can almost think of them as sponges under the ground. All right? So when you drill a hole in the ground, don't think that there's some underground lake that you could send a scuba diver down into and let him paddle around. These are water-saturated rocks. Very often out in the high plains, there are sands and gravels that are, have become saturated with water over the course of a number of years. So let's talk about the High Plains Aquifer and the Ogallala. The Ogallala is a subset of the High Plains Aquifer. High Plains Aquifer, just a big term for this aquifer that, that underlines all are part, underlies all are part of eight states. Now I really want to make this, I'm going to make this, this point repeatedly. This is not a big bathtub of water. It's highly variable from place to place to place. And you can see just from this map, pick out the state that's really water rich when it comes to Ogallala, it's obvious, Nebraska. Some states have just a little bit of it, though, just a panhandle in Oklahoma. It's highly variable. And it's found in these pore spaces of these rocks. The amount of the rock underneath there that's saturated with water is called the saturated thickness. It's a self-defining term that, I'll, that we use a lot in the world that I live in. This is what the Ogallala looks like where it crops out, out in western Kansas. Kind of a conglomerate kind of material. But even in that picture, you can see all this pore space, these big holes that's there for the water to fill up. Okay? So, in Kansas, here's the Ogallala part of the High Plains. The High Plains Aquifer includes a number of aquifers. The big gorilla in the whole bunch is the Ogallala. Now, the other one, and it covers about the western third of Kansas. The other ones are this uh, Great Bend Prairie Aquifer in central Kansas and the Equus Beds, in, uh, also in central Kansas. And the Equus Beds is a source of water for the city of Wichita. So it's a big deal locally. But I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about the Ogallala because that's really the name of the story and it's kind of the poster child for the issues that you were talking about, Cynthia. So, beginning in, oh, really once the advent, you get these large pumps that can pump a lot of water, people began drilling big wells in the Ogallala, brought the water to the surface and putting it on the ground to, to grow crops. Because obviously, when you only get 15 inches of rain a year, there's limits to what you can grow agriculturally out west. So they began by putting it on fields in a form called flood irrigation. This is an aerial view of a field up at this end. I guess it'd be on your left. Uh, there's a big pipe with holes in it, pump water out of the Og Ogallala, it comes out of holes in that pipe and flows down furrows in these fields and that's how you irrigate. And that's what everybody did up until about the 1960s and 70s. And you can see water flows down the field and waters the crops. This method does not work very well because you have to put a lot of water on this end of the field in order to get water down to that end of the field. So the plants up here get waterlogged and the plants down here just barely get a taste. So it doesn't work very well that, that way. It also doesn't work very well because you, you've got to have a fairly flat but not quite level field for the water to very slowly run down here. It's not a great system, but
but it's what everybody had and it's what everybody used until the 1950s and 60s when they began using center pivot systems. Now these systems, and you've probably all seen them anytime you've ever driven across western Kansas, are basically big lawn sprinklers up on wheels. They've got a lot of advantages, one of which is you spread the water out evenly. As these things go rotate, they rotate across the field up on wheels. They spread the water out evenly, so each plant gets the same drink as it goes across the field, and that's much more efficient. You also don't have to flatten out your fields to do this. These things can crawl up over little hills. So it has terrific advantages as an as a, as a efficient way of putting water onto crops. This is what they look like from the air. You've probably seen them if you've flown over western Kansas. I personally find it interesting to learn what people will believe these features really are. <laughs> I've always been surprised at what people will buy. Uh, and uh, you know, you can fill in your own joke here, but uh, this is what these things look like. Generally they do a quarter section of ground, some of them are bigger than that. This led to a revolution in the economy of western Kansas. Because with the availability of water from the Ogallala, and with the efficient ways to put it on the ground, you can now grow crops that you could not grow previously with 15 inches of precip a year. One of them is corn. The big one is corn. Now suddenly you can grow a very thirsty plant out on the high plains where you could never grow it before. With that corn, you can now feed cattle. With cattle, you can now build big feedlots and build big packing plants. And this is one of those packing plants. It's now, it's now operated by Tyson, not IBP. And it's out by the town of Garden City in southwestern Kansas. This is, uh, at the time it was built, its capacity about 5,500 head of cattle today. That is, they can kill 5,500, slaughter 5,500 head of cattle per day. That was the biggest uh, packing plant in the world at the time it was built. It's still one of the largest. The cattle go, uh, they, this uh, sort of rounded thing. Yeah, right here is where the cattle come in. They go up this chute, they go into here. And they come out the other side in little boxes. Uh, there are five of these packing plants in western Kansas now. When I was a kid, I grew up on a farm in central Kansas. We raised cattle, and our cattle went to either Wichita, sometimes up here to Kansas City, very rarely to Omaha to be, uh, to be processed. Today, there, there aren't packing plants in any of those towns. They're all in Garden City and Liberal and a number of those cities out on the high plains of western Kansas. Yeah. So how long did it take you, at the point of comparison, from calf to slaughter back on your operation when you were growing up? No. I know this will sound funny, Jay. I don't really know because we didn't raise calves. We went out and bought calves. We bought calves a year old, and they were usually two and a half years old by the time they went, went away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so today, there are packing plants all across the high plains. And the packing plants are all across the high plains because that's where the cattle are. And the cattle are there because that's where the corn is. And the corn is there because of the water. So it all goes back to the water. And this has completely changed the face, not just of the physical landscape out there, where you now see corn. And pre this is short grass prairie country. If you'd have been out there 200 years ago, all you've seen is buffalo grass. Today you see a canopy of corn everywhere you go. It didn't just change the physical look of the landscape. Garden City, I think the Garden City School District teaches in 26, 26 different languages because of immigrants who come to this city to work in this place. Garden City is one of the most diverse, probably by far the most diverse city in Kansas. And it all goes back to water. Okay, so let's talk about that, what's going on with the Ogallala, and how that's changing a little bit. This is, remember that term, saturated thickness? How much of the subsurface saturated with water? Remember that one? Little figure there? Okay. This is western Kansas. I, I've lopped off eastern Kansas for now because it doesn't matter for the sake of this conversation. So Wichita, just to get you oriented, here's Cedric County. This is where Wichita is, northwestern, southwestern Kansas, all right? darker the color, the more saturated thickness, more water. And what you can see is, again, what I said a little bit ago, the Ogallala is highly variable from place to place to place. Standing right here, you might be above 100 feet of saturated thickness, but go just over here, and you may be down to 10 or 20. It's highly variable. 
And you see that when it comes to the Ogallala in, in uh, western Kansas, southwestern Kansas has lots more than some parts of western Kansas don't, don't have any at all. Highly variable. In this case, 300 feet or more in some cases of the ground of the subsurface is saturated with water. That's a lot. Okay, so what's been happening since the advent of that big scale irrigation? These are water levels in Kansas throughout the High Plains, so I'm including more than just the Ogallala, but you can see these things. Every year they drop a foot or two. And if you were to look just at southwestern Kansas, you'd see that every year they drop three or four feet. I, help, I go out there every year and help measure these things. We measure these wells in January because uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which is that they don't pump during January and you, you can't measure these things while they're pumping. I go out and help measure these things, and I'm not even sure why I do it, but I, I actually I learn a lot and it's a good time. I put this picture of me here. Some years it snows and it's pretty miserable, but one year I was out there, it was southwestern Kansas, it was 85 degrees in January, and this is me taking a measurement. I put this in, you guys don't care about this, but occasionally people that know me uh, set in on this talk, and the people that know me, a lot of them have never actually seen me do anything. <laughs> So this is proof that I do occasionally do something. The, pic the guy who took this picture, I said it's like wildlife photography. You know how like the photographer lies in wait for, you know, <laughs> years to see the impala eat the, you know, the lion eat the impala. That's what this is. You know, I come up, he gets this shot of me working, and then I go back to what I'm usually doing. I anyway, so this is, uh, but uh, the, the farm I grew up in was a dry land farm. That's a term for a non-irrigate, dry land farming, non-irrigation. Irrigation is new to me, and I learn a lot by going out there. So we go out there every year. We drop steel tapes down a well. We, all these dots up there in the far left-hand corner are the wells that we go out and measure as part of that process to get an idea of what these water levels are doing because people have known, <laughs> people have known since the 60s that this water level is, is going down. Okay. I also like going out there because you never know what you're going to run into, and uh, this is not my picture, but one of the guys on the water level crew did came back one afternoon. I, I met him at, at my little towns. He said, you're not going to believe what I just saw, a guy uh, in a pickup with a monkey. <laughs> and uh, he said, and you can even see this. He said the monkey was uh, wearing a diaper. And uh, I said, are you sure it just wasn't a little kid that needed a haircut? And he said, no, I've got a picture. And so uh, we have, of course, put bars across the eyes to protect the uh, the identity of the people involved here, but uh, I, I, <laughs> I do love going out there because I mean, it isn't just stuff like this. You get to see, you almost always see large herds of antelope, and, and it's just, there, there's cool parts of the country out there, and so it's fun to go do. Okay, so we've known since at least the 40s, prior to the 40s, the, the sense on the Ogallala was it's infinite. We can't pump, we can't pump all that water. There's too much to pump. It's an underground ocean. Beginning in the 40s was the realization that we could. Really beginning in the 60s is the beginning of the realization not only can we, but we are, and it's creating problems. These are accumulated water level changes, really only over a few years, but again, it shows you where this issue is the worst, and the hotter colors are where we've seen bigger water level decline, all right? And again, this is just the western half of the state. Here's Wichita over here. Uh, Garden City, where I had that meat packing plant picture, is right there. And you watch over time, year by year by year, and you can watch these declines occur. And what you really see is they're worse in some places than others, right? Just like I said, it's highly variable. And what you really see are some big declines in absolute feet down here in southwestern Kansas. You see those reds kind of blossom up there south of uh, Garden City. Problem is very different from place to place across the High Plains. Okay, so everybody follow that thing. That was absolute declines. Now, I like talking to audiences that don't have any trouble with these concepts because looking at absolute declines is one to way to identify this problem, but another way is the percent of the aquifer that's gone, and that's a better way of looking at it. Because if you have 300 feet of saturated thickness and you remove 100 feet, you've still got 200 feet of water. Okay, so a 100-foot decline is not that big a deal where you start off with 300 feet, 
than in a place where, say, there's only 150 feet. And then you're really in trouble. Yeah. Can, can you tell us what the price difference is between, you know, like per acre, of one of those sections that's gray that has no water on it versus one that has water? Is that um, the economics of that? Uh, yeah, don't quote me on this, but because, uh, again, I'm more familiar with land prices out in, in dry land kinds of sit settings. But I would, and, and those vary according to commodity prices, but I would guess high end, really high quality, non irrigated ground today might be a couple thousand dollars an acre, but with good water, you're probably looking at more like five or six. Okay, so on a percentage basis, this is the amount of the aquifer that's depleted. And this is a more meaningful way to look at it than that previous map. Because, again, the hotter the colors, the bigger percent that's depleted, in effect, the less water still available. And what you see here is West Central Kansas, right up in here, in effect, <coughs> in a lot of respects, the game's already over. And it's highly variable in southwestern Kansas, and, and it varies from place to place in northwestern Kansas. Highly variable. But if you want to know what the future of the high plains without irrigation is going to look like, go to west central Kansas because that's where it's already taken place. Okay. What about recharge? Does this thing replenish naturally? Well, not in any meaningful way. These are recharge numbers, the movement of precip back into the ground. And as you would expect, remember that map I showed you that I, the, with the yellow dotted lines that I was so excited about? Well, when you don't get much rain, and it's, a lot of it falls in the summertime when it just evaporates, you don't have much of it to go back into the ground and recharge the aquifer. So recharge out in western Kansas may be a half an inch a year, maybe an inch. Gets more as you go east, but let's say it's an inch a year. We're taking the water out in, say, southwestern Kansas at the rate of three or four feet per year, and it's being naturally replenished at the rate of one inch per year. Now, you all probably talk about water as a renewable resource, and it is, but it's not out there. And you're taking it out at the rate of 50 or 100 times that it's being replenished. This is a non-renewable resource, and that's really how you have to treat it out, out there. Okay, so how long is the water going to last? This is the $64 map. This is the one everybody... When I go out and talk in western Kansas, this is the map everybody wants to see. Now, it has a lot of, there's a lot that goes into this map. This is based on how long you can expect to, to pump 400 gallons of water per minute. So it's not aimed at a house well, a domestic well. This is aimed at big irrigation wells. But again, the hotter the colors, the browns and the reds, the less time they have left. And again, what you see is, in some places, they can go quite a while. And in other places, the game's already over. Rex? Yeah. Does that map account for climate change? No. This map is, is based on, what is it? Yogi Berra said predictions are difficult, except about the, especially about the future or something like that. We can't really predict anything. All we can do is look at, say, how people have used water over the last 10 years and use that to project, and that's all this does. And we don't take, I mean, it reflects climate change only to the extent that climate change has affected the last 10 years of pumping, right? Here's the problem. We can't predict because we don't know what commodity prices are gonna do. When commodity prices go up, people pump more water. They plant more corn and they pump more water. When energy gets expensive, they pump less water. When I first started giving this talk in the 80s, people would tell me energy will solve the water problem. Energy will get so expensive in western Kansas they won't be able to pump the Ogallala. Well, here we are in 2017, energy's probably cheaper than it was when people made those comments back in the 80s, but energy does influence the amount that people pump. Uh, that pump. So, and, and rain. The more it rains, the less they pump. That's not too hard to figure out. But we don't know what commodity price is going to do in the future. We don't know what energy prices are going to do. We don't know how much it's going to rain. So all we do is take the past 10 years, we project it off into the future and say, if people continue to behave the way they have been behaving, this is what it's going to last. So it's a projection. 
no, uh, for, what, for what it's worth, Jay, I allowed no time in this talk to talk about what people are doing about this problem. Uh, and I bet I'd be glad to touch on that if we have time when we get done. I'm going to move now from groundwater to surface water. And I, I will say, because I do think there are some things going on in Kansas that could be revolutionary if they work. But that remains to be seen. Okay, back to this, surface water. I'm not going to talk much about surface water because it, it, mostly the world I lived in was groundwater, but I do want to mention a couple of things that I think are very important. And uh, here is one of them. This is a map of perennial streams in Kansas, first in 1961, then in 1994, and I've got an, an update coming in the next slide. Perennial streams are the ones where water runs all the time, and you don't have to know anything to look at the top one and the bottom one and basically see we've dried up streams all across western Kansas. This is the Arkansas River. By the way, Cynthia, it's the Arkansas River. I just, I, if, as you talk to people out in the rest of the country, they occasionally mispronounce that word. I just want to be clear. Uh, this is the Arkansas River. It's been dry from Garden City to Great Bend since 1985. Now, I talk all about a lot of issues, not just water, as, I, as in this role uh, when I was director of the survey. And uh, during that time, one of the big concerns everybody had was fracking, and I dealt a lot with earthquakes related to disposal, like Jade mentioned. If you were to ask me about an environmental issue that faces this state that nobody talks about, it's this blank spot from here to here. This is either, depending on how you define it, the second or third largest river in this state, and it's dry. And nobody talks about it. And I can't tell you how much that irritates me. This is one of the largest, most important state rivers in this state. And on the rare occasions there are, is water in it, everybody is shocked. Wow, there's water in the river. Well, what kind of a state is it that people are shocked to go down to the river and see water? So I think it's an incredibly sad set of circumstances. And it's not just the arc. You, you see these dotted lines. These are the ones that are dry on a lot of these reaches of those streams throughout western Kansas. This is a graph showing uh, one of the creeks that uh, comes in above the reservoir Cedar Bluff out in western Kansas. And you can see these, th these are hydrographs. You can basically see the slope of the line and what they're doing. So this is the Smoky Hill, another big river out in western Kansas. And if you think that none of these rivers affect you, keep in mind that everything that comes east starts out west when it comes to water in Kansas. Okay, I want to finish up with one last connection. So we've talked about groundwater and its importance to the state and what's been happening with it. Talk briefly, I touched briefly on uh, surface water in terms of stream flow and the attention that gets or lack thereof. And now I want to sort of bring these things together. Now I don't expect you to sit out there and read the numbers on this map. It's a percent population change demographic map for the state of Kansas. And uh, again, the hotter colors are the colors where you see numbers going down. And the, like the blues are where population is going up. Now people, in, and you can see that population in effect is emptying out of western Kansas and has been for some time. Now people in Kansas, I don't know that this is so much true today, but when I was growing up, I think it's still true to a certain extent, people in this state think of themselves as a rural people. We almost define ourselves as an agricultural state and a farming people. Half the population in this state lives in five counties out of the 105. Johnson, where we are, Wyandotte, Douglas, Shawnee, Cedric, down where Wichita is. Five counties, half the population out of 105. 20 to 25 percent lives in one county, this one. I would submit that when half your population lives in five counties out of 105 counties, you are not an agricultural or rural people. You're an urban people, okay? Now, that's important for two reasons. But one is, stop and think about all the places that I've been talking about that have water problems, and where are they? They're in those red counties that are emptying out already. And where are they going? To the blue counties. 
And did I talk about water problems in Johnson County at all? In my world, Johnson County doesn't have water problems. Where I live in Douglas County, the water utility loves it the more water you use. The more water you use, the happier they are. They got plenty of water, and they like to sell it to people. My point is, if these, problems out, if these counties out west already have a demographic problem with moving from west to east, the impact of the things I've been talking about in water are just going to exacerbate that, and they are. So this is a, not just an issue of what you can grow or what people do out there. It's an issue that impinges very much on who we are as a people. This is central to us. This is another way of projecting that population change. Same thing. So, I'm going to finish up with one last story. And it does connect to what I was just talking about. Because as people become more urbanized, they typically have less access to natural experiences, open spaces. And that is really true in this state, because Kansas is either last or next to the last, depending on how you want to measure it, in terms of per capita publicly accessible property, okay? You know, I've mentioned the one national park that we have. Kansas doesn't have much. Kansas is almost all private property. So we have less accessible public property than virtually any state in this country, and yet we are an increasingly urbanized people. Well, that's a big deal to me. Because I think the more people can get out on those, lo those places, the better off they are, but we're becoming increasingly urbanized in a place where there are fewer opportunities to do that. But this is one place you can go do it. This is Point of Rocks in the Cimarron National Grasslands out in far southwestern Kansas. It's in Morton County. It's down by the, the little town of Elkhart. This is as about as far from here as you can get and still be in the state of Kansas. I think I looked up once that this location is closer to the state capitals of Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming than it is to Topeka. This is a long ways out there. But this is the largest publicly accessible piece of property in the state of Kansas. It's about 100,000 acres. It was set aside during the Dust Bowl years to, to take, basically taken out of production to keep the land from growing. This is a spot on the Cimarron National Grasslands called Point of Rocks. Uh, this again is the Ogallala Formation cropping out up here. This is the Cimarron River down here. This is the Ogallala cropping out. And uh, if you're ever headed to New Mexico or Colorado sometime, you're down in that southwestern corner of Kansas, especially this time of year, go check this place out. It's a glorious example of the short grass to grow. So this, this is a spot called Point of Rocks. It was a stop along the old Santa Fe Trail because there was a spring just over in here that they stopped to use. Now, one of the things that I, let me see if I get, this is, the, and this is the point of rocks from looking down below. This is again is the Ogallala Formation. Now, one of the things that I get, got to do when I was director was routinely re lead uh, field trips for legislators. That got a laugh from Jay. Uh, are you, uh, we would take them out to show them stuff out on the ground. And one year we took them out to show them water issues in western Kansas, and we went down to Point of Rocks down in far southwestern Kansas. This was in May, and it happened to be a wet May, and it rained a lot, and there was a flower blooming. This one here. You guys are like, does anybody know what this flower is? Echinacea. No, it's not echinacea. It's a, it, it lo looks a little like coneflower. The reason I ask is, okay, I live in geology. I don't know much about plants. And uh, this is, uh, the, the scientific name for this flower is either uh, Gallardia or Giardia. But they're two very different things. <laughs> I think it's Gallardia, right? Yeah, Giardia is something that you don't want. <laughs> Giardia is a thing found in water that you don't want to ingest. Uh, Bad. Giardia bad, Gallardia good, okay? So an uh, Indian uh, Mexican sunflower, various common names. It only shows up when you get a fair amount of rain. Well, this year it had rained a lot. And all you could see at Point of Rocks was this haze of orange across the, the landscape 
from this, the blooming of this plant. Now, I had read these pioneer accounts when I was a kid of people going across Kansas and talking about a carpet of wildflowers. And I remember reading that and thinking, boy, that sounds great, but I'll never see that. Well, this day, when we were leading this field trip for these legislators, all you could see were these flowers blooming. And it was one of the most dramatic things I've ever seen. And it all goes back to water. So with that, I'll stop. I don't know how we're doing on time, Jay, if we have time for a question or two. We've got time for, for a couple. I know some of you have to leave for your class schedule. So if you have to take off, that would be a good time to, to do it. But first, let's give Rex a, a hand for that. <clears throat> these drying up. In, when I give this talk out in, in Kansas, people really want to blame the Arkansas River drying up on Colorado because Kansas had a lawsuit against Colorado from 85 to 2005 over delivery of water in the Arkansas River. But Kansas won that lawsuit. Colorado delivers that water. The reason that that's dry now is when it hits that area west of Garden City, a lot of it's diverted by ditch irrigation. About half of it disappears by ditches that send it off to be irrigated. And then the rest of it is groundwater pumping. You know, when you pump wells adjacent to the river, you lower the water table, in effect, the river dries up. So as much as we would like to blame this on uh, Colorado, it's us. Now, you also get a little bit of impact, not much, but you do get an impact of conservation issues. Like if you put it in terraces, it keeps the water on the land. It doesn't run off to go into the river. So. Water conservation is a good thing, but it has impacts that we don't always think about. So that's the source of it. What is the potential for restoration? I would say it's pretty, in spite of how impassioned I feel about this, it's pretty close to zero. Because, and this goes back to one of the points you were making. Everybody that pumps this water has a water right, a legal right given to it by the state of Kansas to pump that water. If you're going to say to them, Boy, this is terrible. You're, driving, you're drying up the Ogallala. We want you to stop. They have a legal right to pump that water. You have got to somehow deal with that legal right. And I don't see any evidence that the state of Kansas has the stomach to take on that water right issue to put water back in the Arkansas River. Or deal with it in much of any other fashion. I, I, okay, I want to touch on the, okay, yeah. How much of the Ogallala and the other aquifers that we have in Kansas have we consumed? Like, how much is not going to be coming back because it's already collapsed? Yeah. Uh, it, it's highly variable from place to place, but you can, you can see on some of those maps that, that I, you know, I would say that, I don't know, don't, I mean, it's, it depends on where you are, but probably in a lot of, overall, I would say maybe a third of it is gone. But where you are in a place there wasn't much to begin with, in effect, it's all gone. Now, I, I want to touch on this real quick. Yeah. Are we just going to have to accept that when the oval is the overall? Okay, that's a, yeah. Okay, do we just have to live with it? And right now, I would say it appears to me that's what that, that's the answer the state of Kansas has given. In western Kansas, the policy is planned depletion. We're going to use it up. We're going to live with it. We're going to make a bunch of money off of corn for as long as it lasts, and then we're going to walk away and go back to dry land farming. Now, there, and this is what I w did want to touch on responses. There's a location up in northwestern Kansas where a bunch of landowners have come together in one county and have voluntarily cut back pumping by 20% per year over the last five years. They haven't done it, they haven't been forced to do it by the state, they have agreed to do it on their own cooperatively. And the argument they've given for doing it is we want our kids to be able to live out here. If we use up all the water, they're not going to be able to live up here. They're using your intergenerational fairness argument. That's the argument 
that they're making, and that's the experiment that they're running, and right now it looks like you don't have to cut that much to extend the life of the aquifer quite a bit. And 20% may get you a lot of years on out there down the road. But I can also tell you, you go down to southwestern Kansas and you try that intergenerational argument with them, they'll laugh in your face. I've talked to these guys. You know what they say when I go tell them maybe you ought to leave some of that water? They'll say, well, what good is that water doing down there now? If I leave it down there, what good is it? Well, you better have an answer to that question if you're going to tell somebody that they can't pump water to put on crops that they've spent a lot of money on, what's your answer going to be? Be fair to people 100 years from now? I can tell you how far that goes. That answer goes in this economic and political climate. But you better have an answer to that question. Now, here's my answer. If we could fast forward 100 years from now and still be sitting in this room, I will bet you almost any amount of money, if we could do that, people will, sitting in this room will be looking at us standing here today saying, and they'll be thinking, what was wrong with you people? Why did you pump all that high quality water out of the ground to grow corn, 30 or 40 percent of which goes to make ethanol, and today we need that water, and it's not there. I will guarantee you that is going to happen. We think we're enlightened. They're going to look back at us and say, man, what was wrong with you? What were you thinking? But I can tell you how that far that argument goes with the legislature, too. Yeah. Couldn't this, in the end, wouldn't help all too much. But instead of charging per year to pump water, couldn't we charge per gallon to most agricultural? Just, just to be clear, there is no charge. They, there is no charge to pump this water. The only charge, the only cost is, I mean, you've got to pay for your irrigation system and mostly either electricity, propane, something for energy, but the state does not charge you a nickel to pump that water out of the ground. And, and by the way, there, you know, there's a larger discussion right now about a state water plan and how to fund a state water plan. One of the ideas, which is going nowhere, is actually to do that, is to levy a small fee per gallon on water coming out of the ground, of groundwater to help fund all of these remediation projects. Because, I mean, it, it's, if you think about it, it's smart enough because that means you're not charging people who never use that much water a set price when everyone... What, what's really interesting is the law in Kansas says water belongs to the people of the state of Kansas. These people don't own water under the ground, they own a water right. They own the right to pump water. But that water out there under the ground, it belongs to you. And they're using it, but there is no charge. And if you want to commit political suicide in this state, go to Topeka and propose a penny per thousand gallons. I mean, that's nothing. And those guys will shoot you out of the saddle so fast, it, you won't even see it coming. So there is no charge. And that goes back to your valuing water, because in effect, other than the cost of energy, there is no value placed on it. Yeah. Um, I noticed that when you put the 1961 and 1994 maps up there showing those rivers, uh, 93 was the floods of the Missouri River and so forth, uh, and it seems to have no impact even a year later. What happens in one given year doesn't really matter for a problem like this. So, we can't rely on the environment to replenish these. We have to do it ourselves. Well, and, and that sort of goes back to the question about what's the prospect for, you know, for getting water in there. Yeah, you would have to change your, the cha you'd have to change behaviors so dramatically. You'd have to cut out irrigation up and down the Arc River corridor to put for water to go back into that. Uh, yeah, th this is not something that's gonna happen by itself. Yeah, we just, we need to change behaviors just so we don't have more rivers. Yeah, I know there's, there, there are or were some ethics students in here. And this is a sort of pretty, very interesting ethical argument uh, to take a look at, right? What is the what do, what do farmers in Western Kansas owe, if anything, right, to uh, to future generations or to those experts 100 years from now who look back and go, what were you people thinking? We have some extra time, by the way. Lunch will not be served until 11:30, so if you have more questions, feel free to ask. Uh, and, and, I, and, and this is something you don't hear very often, but I may be taking my life in my hands by saying this, but I've actually heard Sam Brownback make that 
intergenerational fairness argument himself. I've, but he will say it in the context of the state is not going to solve this problem for you. You're going to have to solve it yourself. And intergenerational fairness is his argument for why. But that's a tough sell, man. Yeah. Um, point one, that's just cowardly. But <laughs> what do you think about the cockamamie idea of the aqueduct from the Kansas River down to the southwest where they will not stop what they're doing? Let's see. Yeah. You, you mentioned this, uh, Cynthia. In the, in the 80s, people talked about, uh, in addition to my other faults, I'm colorblind, and so I'm sure there's a dot up there somewhere. I don't know where, it, why am I doing this? I, it's up here, so, well, anyway, taking water from about here and taking it out to western Kansas. That idea has resurfaced again just a few years ago. Uh, okay, before you dismiss this out of hand, we're doing it already, okay? In the Wichita area, on the Little Arkansas River, during high flood, of, high flow, flood events, floods, water is taken out of the Little Arkansas River, put in a pipeline, some of it's treated, and it's moved 15 miles west and put in the Equus Beds Aquifer for the city of Wichita. Same thing, artificial recharge, let's call it. It's done all over the west, and we're doing it in Kansas right now. Now, there is a little difference between taking water out of the Little Arkansas, moving it 15 miles, and taking it out of the Missouri River and moving it out here. That has a few other issues. One is, and is it's a lot higher in elevation out in western Kansas than it is here in eastern Kansas. So you've got to lift this water a couple thousand feet. That takes a lot of energy. That's a long pipeline. I remember, I see various numbers, but probably 250 miles of pipeline or aqueduct. Uh, there's also people downstream from the from us who don't think this is a great idea. It's got a lot of economic and, and uh, economic issues, uh, environmental issues, but I would say the legal issues may be the biggest impediments. And in spite of that, it's gotten more traction than I ever thought it would. There are people in southwestern Kansas who will tell you that's the solution. In fact, if you go out there today and ask for their solution to this issue, that's the solution. Well, it just rewards the worst behavior. Well, here's how this may work, okay, which is there are big cities, there's one big city along the way, right, Wichita, and there are two or three big cities out there on the front range of the Rocky Mountains called Denver and Colorado Springs. And if you can uh, maybe go together with people who really need water, I don't think this is as, do I think this is a good idea? Of course I don't. But this, could this happen? I've seen stranger things. So it's gotten a lot of traction. And they will say, I've heard them make this argument, we build, oil, we build pipelines for oil all the time. Water's a lot more important than oil. Why shouldn't we build a pipeline for water? Well, I, I just can't even imagine it getting any traction once litigation begins, because that doesn't just affect Kansas. The Missouri, the Missouri governor's already called Sam Brown back some names over this, and, and uh, yeah, I, uh, legally, that water, it goes downstream, yeah. Yeah, at some, at some point, we have a student question we'll get to in a second, but, uh, but to that point also, this urban-rural divide in, in Kansas, there's some folks in Kansas City, the Kansas City area, who wouldn't be a big fan of this idea either, and so there's a lot of, there'll be a lot of political bloodshed in Topeka. I think and the other part is somebody's got to pay for it, and I've the price tag I've seen is about twenty to twenty-five billion dollars, which oddly $5 enough, billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, and I don't get the sense that folks out here are talking about them paying for it because they couldn't afford that much. But here, hey, here's an economic argument they will make all the time, and this goes back to your question about land value. Okay, so let's say there's a three or $4,000 per acre difference in the value of that land with versus not water. Okay, that's kind of what I was guessing. I may be wrong, but, but you get the point. It's worth a lot more with water than without. Well, if they dry up, look at the economic impact that has, whereas if you build that pipeline and get water out there, you retain the value of that land. Problem solved. Is it really that stupid an idea? Yeah. I was just curious what behaviors you think we should change. You know, this, I, th that is a great question because 
you know, I, like, I go out and talk to people in, in Douglas County, over in Lawrence, where I live, and they say, well, you know, it's important that we use low flow toilets, and it's important that we shut the water off when we're shaving and brushing our teeth and da 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 da. I hate to say this, Jay, but I kind of go, why? Because water one's got all the water it knows what to do with, and then some. I'm standing up here giving an anti conservation <laughs> message. Yeah, why, 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 why do you guys do <laughs> but the point is, you may save water here in eastern Kansas. That's not going to have anything to do with what I'm talking about. Yeah, can, can, now I'm not saying you ought to waste water. Don't get me wrong. That's not the point. But what I am saying is that simple knee jerk reaction of let's use low flow toilets doesn't have anything to do with this. Uh, probably, the, you know, one of the behavior answers that probably is the right one. Boy, nobody ever asked me that question. My dad, if he were still alive, would kill me. But here's one answer. Don't eat so much beef. Right? Because that's what, those feedlots are out there for a reason. And they're using that corn that's using that water. And I've seen those numbers on what it takes, you know, gallons of water to produce a, a, a pound of beef. I would guess if you really want to have an impact on this problem, that's far more important than a low flow toilet. I could think of some more things that, I mean, your question, I mean, yeah, and obviously this issue of political engagement, involvement, and everything else that, that Cynthia was talking about is part of this as well. But I can also tell you, and I know this firsthand, if you think a bunch of people in eastern Kansas are going to go out and tell people out in western Kansas what to do, <laughs> good luck with that. No, we'll tell them what to do, we each will be well received. <laughs> that is an understatement. Because that is what happened. Uh, I, I can tell you that, and, and this is, a, this is imp important stuff here. Those, those folks hate, the, hate government in any form. They hate the federal government worse than anybody. They hate state government next, and they hate local government least of all. So they developed a lot of local strategies for dealing with this issue because it kind of is a local problem. The problem is it's really tough to deal with this on a local government issue because you, you got the same people living out there that got to shut them down and they're not going to do that. So your question is a very good one. The political engagement is one, but it's a really tough environment to do it in. Yeah. So at what point is it going to be gone? So the, the, the question of eat less beef or the idea of eat less beef is going to be, well, there's no beef, so when will that happen? The, I don't think you're ever going to, you know, I always tell people, you're not going to go out there and just see the land blow up and dry away like it did and dry away and blow up like in the prairie grass. Uh, what you're going to see is instead of growing corn, they'll grow cotton. They're doing that already. Uh, they'll grow milo, so green sorghum, which takes less water. They'll grow more wheat as opposed to corn. They'll change the cropping patterns. I do think you'll probably, if, if you could envision that 100 years from now, you'd see more short grass per and probably cattle on pasture out there, which then maybe I'm telling you, okay, go ahead and eat beef. I don't know. But you'll see changes in behaviors. But all of them take fewer people. So those population centers out there, it's tough because those, those people grow corn for a reason. They make more money. This is not complex stuff. They're doing what they do because this country is a capitalistic country, right? Don Worcester's, my favorite book of Don Worcester's is his Dust Bowl book about High Plains Dust Bowl. That makes the point. This, this is an, these people are behaving rationally. They're doing what the system has told them to do. If you're going to tell them not to do it, you better have a good reason. There are also incentives for growing corn for ethanol, right? That people in this can have an impact on Theoretically, I, I would guess as long as Iowa has the first primary in the country, we'll still play uh, ethanol support. Yeah, you had, yeah. Uh, are all five packing plants uh, in Kansas owned by Tyson? No. Uh, I don't, n National Beef is one of them. I'd have to go look and see, but no. Uh -uh. And there was, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, how great of an impact do you think that fleeing Western population will have on the depletion of the aquifer? None. Bec because they're just, uh, 
it just takes fewer people to do the work, but the work's still getting done. So no, it, it, it won't make any, any difference that way. Here's one other thing I want to say because I love saying this because it make it, it will it will sound like it makes no sense to you, which my wife is very accustomed to hearing me say things that make no sense. They use conservation measures out there now. It used to be that those water sprinklers shot water up in the air like a lawn sprinkler does, but that water evaporates. It's not very efficient. Nowadays, you see these drop-down nozzles in the canopy of the corn because not so much water evaporates. The big thing now is what are called dragon lines, which are lines that drag on the ground following that center pivot system. The water comes out of little holes and hoses. It goes directly to the roots of the crops. It's very highly efficient. Don't mistake water conservation like that for using less water. Just because people become more efficient and they conserve water doesn't mean they use less. Because once they save water here, they go use it someplace else. So we're a lot more efficient, and, and the K-State people will talk about this all, all the time. We are so efficient. We use every drop of that water. But then we go use it someplace else. We grow more corn. Yeah. Great. So we have the technology to like actually seed clouds. It was originally used as a weapon in Vietnam. But um, would it be possible to, you know, minimize the negative effects that seeding clouds would have while trying to get people <coughs> off the ground water while using the rain that's coming in from seeded clouds? They, they, ha there has been a major. Uh, uh, cloud seeding program in western Kansas for a number of years out in west central Kansas where it's, things are kind of the worst. Long-term studies have shown that for that thing the, the amount of precip increase has been pretty small. It, the reason that they have continued to do it is because of hail suppression. It's really good at stopping bad hail storms that destroy crops but in terms of big increases in precip they really haven't seen much. So I I would agree, so I, there, there is no technological answer to this question. That is, uh, yeah, K-State's got more efficient crops. But, but sooner or later, you just got to use less water, one way or another. We're going to solve this problem. We will solve this problem. We will either dr use less water one way or another. We'll either dry that thing up, or we'll figure out a better way to extend the life of the aquifer. We'll solve it. But the question is, what's left when we do? A couple of thoughts here before we uh, move down, downstairs for, uh, for, for lunch. Let's give Brett one more round of applause. You know, a couple of you talked about uh, diversion projects. The, the mother of all diversion projects, if anybody wants a kind of a wacky research uh, project for class, here it comes was something proposed back in the late 50s and early 60s called the North American Water and Power Alliance. This bad boy, and you can find a very cheesy YouTube from pro promotional video that someone's put on YouTube from, from, from this time period, the early 60s, would have taken water from the Yukon River up in, uh, up in British Columbia and Alaska and taken it down through the Rocky Mountain Trench into the uh, watershed of the Colorado River and the Missouri River and the Great Lakes. This thing would have taken 12 nuclear power plants uh, to, to provide the energy to get the water over all the various terrain. And it just shows you the kind of Frankenstein-esque engineering solutions uh, that people can throw out there when they get desperate enough. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how far this much more modest proposal goes in Kansas, although I don't think it's ever really going to get anywhere, but Rex has more of, a, of a, his, a sense of this power than I do. The last thing I want to say before we go to lunch is, um, e even though uh, Rex is somewhat you know, despairing of, of us having any water problems here in East northeastern Kansas, the set of problems we have are very different. I mean, the problem here is not having too little water, it's sometimes having too much water. And so this issue about sewer systems being uh, overtaxed, about old stormwater and wastewater systems falling apart, those are the issues that we face here in this part of the state. And so I would encourage some of you to maybe do some research in that, into that area if you have interest. And one more note about creative wastewater systems. Some of you may be aware that just down the street from here, Johnson County Wastewater has a water treatment plant that actually does convert biogas into fuel, or convert biosolids into biogas and thus into fuel on a, on a limited basis. So these cool technologies are out there, and you can even go see them. The question is, which ones do you scale up, and who gets to decide how that happens? 
so with that, we are concluding our morning sessions. Uh, lunch will be served uh, downstairs in the cap fed room uh, at about 11.30, so you know, begin to make your way down there. And certainly if you have questions, feel free to uh, contact one of our speakers. They'll be happy to talk to you. So thank you, and we'll see you for lunch.